But again, I would, as an anthropologist, I would say this is a cultural narrative. Uh, we, one that's purchased with media time and money. Um, the narrative says you will benefit economically from the bases. But what are the economic benefits of bases? The economic effects of bases? They are, if you look at the U.S. as a whole, primarily redistributional rather than generative, unlike, for example, manufacturing or educational or healthcare jobs. And what I mean by that is military spending does not evenly water the social landscape. It comes and flows down and then flows in particular directions. So if you look, um, let, me just, let me just go forward to this slide and show an average year of the Cold War in which uh, well, there's a whole field of uh, military geography uh, and those scholars have put together the data on where tax dollars come from and then where they go vis-a-vis -vis, um, military funding. So taking just military prime contracts per capita, um, this shows that the, the states in black are states which received more than 100% of the tax dollars they paid in uh, to the federal government. So uh, these states benefited and the states in the white uh, might, uh, were receiving under less than a quarter of the dollars that they raised back in the form of these, uh, um, these military contracts. And that's not all military spending. Obviously, there's military personnel spending and so on. But um, even states that consider themselves to be military, to benefit from the military, like, like North Carolina, uh, one has to see that, again, in, in, in some parts of the military budgeting, uh, it, it, they are actually putting more money out into the rest of the country and, and, uh, rather than receiving it in. Um, that military redistribution of wealth uh, results in, in many military-based communities, more inequality rather than less inequality. This is an image of two kinds of housing in Fayetteville. Uh, there are a few people, particularly owners of retail businesses, who uh, make quite a bit of money selling to soldiers. Uh, and then there are a whole lot of people who are either unemployed or the working poor who work in the primary kind of job created by military, large military bases like this, which is retail. Um, and so, again, you see a lot of more the, the sort of uh, very visible kinds of inequality in Fayetteville than in other communities. Now, the military itself actually creates more equality. Uh, the highest to the lowest paid military uh, worker, soldier, uh, sailor marine, is it's in a ratio of eight to one, uh, the, the general to the private. In the uh, civilian sector, as we know, that ratio can be 24,000 to one, right? Um, so when, a, when the military comes to town, uh, it creates more equality just on the basis of the salaries it's paying its own workers. Um, but uh, these other redistributional effects more than uh, reverse that effect. Um, in other words, the, the lowest to the highest paid person in Fayetteville, it, it, there's a wider gap there than there is in other communities around North Carolina. And I've done some of the analysis of the the data um, comparing other cities to to North to uh, to Fayetteville, and it, this is the case. In addition, again, the toxins that are produced through military operations are often uh, distributed, and the and the cost of dealing with those are externalized to the civilian world. So, environmental waste um, uh, is is just one example. But in addition, we have to look at um, what is the economists call returns to service. Um, if uh, large numbers of people from a community go into military service, um, we can ask of any particular cohort, and it varies across history and across communities, do, does a matched group of young people um, 10 years out after military service uh, look better off or worse off than a matched cohort? And again, we all know individual stories of people for whom it's clear that they have done much better. Um, but we have to say, you know, the research is necessary in order to uh, demonstrate that because for many cohorts where that research has been done, returns to service have been negative. In other words, um, whether it's based on uh, having become injured and, and uh, lost wages, uh, whether it's you know untreated PTSD um, and resultant homelessness and other things, um, there are many reasons why that sometimes those uh, that the narrative of everybody benefiting from military spending, particularly in that population, um, it doesn't hold up under research scrutiny. Um, JROTC is another example. It's a, it's a program that um, adds resources to schools. On the one hand, on the other hand, it also takes resources from schools. And so the economics of uh, the benefits that are brought by the JROTC funding 
have to be uh, put in context, this larger context of uh, what kind of classrooms are given over to that program, uh, what kinds of additional supplemental salaries are being paid to um, to the uh, military teachers in J. Rotsi that come out of local school budgets. So again, the, the actual economics of this are very complicated, they require research, but they do not, from what we know in certain cases where the research has been done in the domestic U.S., the, the story is not as simple and it's not as positive by any means as the one that um, it standardly gets told um, on Guam and in other military communities. In addition, of course, the volatility of the war cycle has meant that communities like Fayetteville, North Carolina, have had, uh, again, a, a much more tenuous business environment for many kinds of, of companies, um, w which will regularly have waves of, of business closures when soldiers have been deployed to various kinds of operations around the world. Uh, and you're experiencing volatility right now, of course, as this buildup and rumors of the buildup have led to spiking in land prices and uh, housing prices. Again, yeah, that contraction, uh, but contraction will happen, as, as it always does. Obviously, tourism is also a volatile business, and, and there, there is a business cycle on everything. But to, uh, to see the military in that, uh, again, as having that same issue to deal with is, is important. Okay. Um, I'd like to conclude with um, a final thought about some of the legal issues that are also involved. Um, I'm not a legal scholar, but I, I'd simply conclude with, with this question. Um, what are the legal implications of uh, the military buildup on Guam? In her testimony, testimony before the UN Committee of 24 in 2008, Sabina Flores Perez referred to the extremity of what she called, quote, the level and grossness of the infraction of the UN Charter by the US and its military buildup. And again, um, as you all know, she's referring to the fact that uh, this, uh, the UN requires that um, every society be allowed to decolonize, to, to make uh, decisions about um, political status, and, uh, and that militarization is forbidden because it makes that decolonization process uh, more difficult or even impossible. Um, and it, I think the President's words are not hyperbole because Guam's militarization is obviously more extreme in its concentration than that found virtually anywhere else on Earth. There are only a few other areas that are in similar condition, not all, uh, uh, not coincidentally islands such as Okinawa, Diego Garcia, and in the past Vieques, Puerto Rico. Guam objectively has the highest ratio of U.S. military spending and mili military hardware and land takings from indigenous populations of any place on Earth. Uh, and here, there might have been rivals in Diego Garcia or in some areas of the continental U.S. if the U.S. had not forcibly removed all of the indigenous population uh, from those areas. The level and grossness of the infraction has to do with the racial hierarchy, I'd suggest, that fundamentally guides the U.S. in its negotiations with other peoples over the siting of its military bases and the treatment they're accorded once the U.S. settles in. So I, I know this is a very controversial topic and uh, that many of you have been sitting there thinking, when is she gonna stop so I can tell her how she's wrong? And I look forward to that. So, thank you. So I do have another mic here, and so if anyone would like to, we have some time for a few questions, and so I will come to you with the mic, and uh, we'll go this way. <laughs> 